thank you for joining us today for a discussion regarding the many regulations that credit unions need to have in place for compliance management. Our speaker today is Linda Straub-Jones, Director of Market Planning Compliance for LexisNexis Risk Solutions. Linda has over 30 years of experience in the credit collections industry. In her current position, she is responsible for understanding and staying current on the rules and regulations that affect the credit and collections industry and strategizing on how LexisNexis Risk Solutions may help customers with these regulations. Today, Linda is going to share with us ways in which credit unions can implement processes and tools to help them become and remain compliant. Linda, please go ahead. Thank you so much, April, and hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, first, we're going to do a little housekeeping. Uh, legal disclaimer, of course, that all information provided in this presentation is general in nature. It's provided for educational purposes only. It's not legal advice, mainly because I'm not an attorney and I can't give legal advice. So don't take this as legal advice. Uh, so please contact your own attorney if you have questions as a follow-up to this or about your own policies uh, internally. Um, before we get into the agenda, I do want to say that we will be accepting questions at the end as we have time. So if you do have a question that comes up during the webinar, please feel free to type it into the chat box. All right, so briefly on the agenda, we're going to go over some, uh, talk a little bit about the CFPB and some of the enforcement actions they have made in the first party space and against credit unions. We're going to talk a little bit about the CFPB portal and why it's important to take a look at that. Then we're going to discuss policies and procedures, compliance management systems, vendor and service provider audits, compliance analytics, and then compliance scrubs. So, of course, each one of these could be a whole webinar in and of themselves. So I'm just going to touch on each of these to kind of give you an idea of where you should be looking, what you should be keeping in mind as you're thinking about compliance in your credit union. Um, and, and again, you know, each one of these could be a full webinar. So uh, look at each of them in that respect. First, I'm going to take you through some um, statistics that we have. So, as you can see, the um, lawsuits relating to the different regulations that we're you know, mostly aware of here, the CFPB, the FDCPA, the FCRA, TCPA, this kind of gives you an overview of where they have been, where they are going. This is current as of the end of January. Uh, so I don't have February statistics yet, but as you can see, some of the um, complaints are going down, but then some are also going up. Uh, this is a great little way to take the temperature of the industry as far as litigation goes. Uh, I get this information from Web Recon, a great a website to go to, and you can download this information uh, at, on your own for free. So feel free to pop out there at any time you need to you know, keep an eye on these regulations. Uh, first, we're going to have a little poll to get things started. And uh, if you please look uh, at your screen. And April, are you going to kick off the poll for them? Absolutely. Thank you. So a, a poll is showing on your screen here in response to the TCPA and the ACA versus the FCC outcome, please indicate which action you have taken. And if you'll choose one of those options there and then submit it, we'll receive your answer. Thanks, April. So you know, this is one of the uh, things we've been following very closely, and I'm sure you have too. As you guys know, the FCC made a declaratory ruling back in July of 2015. Uh, directly after that declaratory ruling, the ACA, so the American Collectors Association International, um, sued the FCC, uh, just basically calling out four different points within their declaratory ruling and you know, looking for more clarification on those points. So it wasn't until just a couple of weeks ago that that lawsuit uh, came back and a judge made a decision on it. So that's what we're referring to is after that judge has made that decision, hopefully you've all had a chance to look at it. 
And uh, we're just wondering if you've done anything different in your dialing processes as a result of that. So I'm going to close the poll. It looks like everyone has talked about it or put in your, your response. All right, so um, about two-thirds of you didn't make any changes, so I assume that means you were really comfortable with what you were doing in the first place. Uh, a few people tightened up your, your dialing processes, um, which is, you know, it's always good to take a look at the litigation that's out there. Um, there's, you know, even if things are happening at the CFPB and the FCC and all other places, a really good temperature check for the industry is to look at the litigation that's out there. So if you felt that maybe you needed to tighten up a little bit as a result of that, that's great. But I, I'm looking and seeing that most people seem to have already dialed into what their dialing process was. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the TCPA. So this is one of the regulations that regardless of what happens with the CFPB or anything else, the TCPA is still out there. It's been out there. It's going to be out there. And uh, it's something that every, everyone has to pay attention to. And I'm looking, oh, okay, I just want to make sure I'm on the right slide here. So TCPA by the numbers. So current households, we're up to about 51% of households that have a wireless or cell phone only without a landline at all. So very important to be aware of that. Uh, another thing that I find fascinating, which is something to really keep an eye on, is that there's over 100,000 phone numbers each day that are changed. So changed meaning it gets disconnected or I'm reassigned to a new person. So that's a moving target, right? So you always have to be aware of that. And then about 46% um, increase in TCPA cases just since the FCC's July 2015 order. So all very important things to keep aware of. Remembering that the TCPA impacts everybody who is calling a cell phone if you are using an automated dialing system. Now, of course, that's one of the things that was redefined in uh, the declaratory ruling initially back in 2015, and it was also one of the things that was overturned in the ACA's decision. So initially, it was very, very strict. The FCC said that just about everything, including the cell phone that most of you have sitting next to you on your desk right now, would be considered an automated telephone dialing system, simply because it had the capacity to um, randomly dial numbers if you were to add something onto it. Um, the, uh, the ruling that came out just a couple of weeks ago, the judge agreed with the ACA that that was way too broad um, of a definition, and they removed that definition. The thing is, they didn't say what a new definition is. So um, keep an eye open for that. I anticipate that something's going to happen to redefine what exactly the FCC does consider to be an automated, uh, automated telephone dialing system. Uh, so we all are going to have to really keep an eye on that and make sure we're complying as that comes out. All right, moving on. So again, TCPA suits down a bit, but please still be aware of them. Um, as we've seen in most of the suits, an auto dialer or the definition of an auto dialer seems to be uh, a big issue. However, very interesting thing, just last week, um, because of the FCC ACA decision that happened a couple weeks ago, there was a lawsuit last week that actually got uh, dismissed because of this removal of the auto dialer definition. So, it was a lawsuit against a collection agency, and uh, the judge decided in that suit that since the definition of an auto dialer um, was removed by the FCC and that the collection agency had a process in place where they proved they were not auto dialing but manually dialing, they, they ended up winning. So that's a good thing. We're already seeing positive uh, results from that ruling. But one thing to make sure, with or without the ruling, um, you need to make sure you have express consent in writing with your consumers if you're going to call them using an automated dialing system 
and you're going to call their cell phones. So I know there's a lot of requirements in there, but again, you know, using your system, automated system, dialing a cell phone, make sure you've got uh, written consent from your consumers to do so. Um, but be aware that they could revoke that consent at any time. You cannot dictate to your members how to revoke that consent. It can be done in any way the consumer feels is reasonable. So that means they can call you to revoke it. They can email you. If you have online chat, they can revoke it. They can do it physically in the mail. They can come into uh, your credit union or a branch and tell a teller. Uh, etc. So just be aware that if you are going to continue to use that express consent, your consumers can revoke it in any way they feel is reasonable. Um, and then it's the next to the last bullet point, I kind of skipped ahead, but manually dial. Um, if you don't have that express consent, uh, the safest thing is just manually dial to anything that you believe to be a cell phone. So now we're going to move on. We're going to move away from TCPA. If there's anything I didn't cover in that, shoot me a note and i uh, be happy to answer your questions at the end if we have time. So we're going to talk a little bit about the CFPB. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen a, a lot of news back and forth recently about the CFPB uh, with the new director, uh, interim director, Mick Mulvaney, that has been appointed to the CFPB. Uh, things are changing. Um, so we're already seeing some rules being reviewed for um, potential reversal. Uh, the other thing that I find is really interesting is that he is putting out RFIs, requests for information on all of the procedures that the CFPB currently has in place. So things like you know, how complaints are, um, are tracked. By, um, the consumer complaints, how they come into the portal, how the portal acts, how the complaints are tracked, etc. So he really seems to be looking into every little way in which the CFPB operates and looking for direction. He's also put a freeze, temporary freeze, on um, new rules and regulations going out. So things are kind of at a little bit of a standstill um, right now with the CFPB, but that doesn't mean they're going away. Uh, and it doesn't mean that we aren't going to see something happening in the next um, you know, month uh, or year. So continue to keep an eye on the CFPB. Um, I put up on the screen right now enforcement actions just to kind of give you a flavor of what the CFPB has been looking at. So the biggest thing is credit cards followed by mortgage, et cetera. You can read there. <clears throat> All the way down at the bottom, I did put this up there, credit unions. Look at how little. So what, the reason I put in any enforcement actions against credit unions up there is to show you guys are doing a great job. As far as the CFPB is concerned, there's not a lot of activity relating to credit unions. So bravo credit unions, you guys are keeping an eye on things. Um, but you can see the types of things the CFPB is looking at. I know credit unions still have credit cards. You do mortgages. So keep an eye on those things especially. Um, and then just to highlight a few of the enforcement actions. Now, <clears throat> this is everything um, that I pulled off the CFPB's website from 2016 and 2017 relating to first-party collections. So it's very specific. There are only four actions out there, only one against a credit union. So again, very good. First party generally um, keeping out of the CFPB's eyesight for, for these enforcement actions. But I did put some of these up here to talk about what the CFPB is looking at when they are doing enforcement actions against first parties. So as you can see, the first one is UDAP. We have a slide in a, a couple of slides to talk more specifically about UDAP, but um, the Citibank one was a, a UDAP re, um, regarding information used in the process of debt collection. Uh, the Navy Federal was um, relating also up to debt collection. Wells Fargo was specific to student loan servicing. And then Security National Automotive, the reason I put this one up here is the first time I have seen something like this. So they initially had um, 
a consent order in 2015, and there were certain requirements set forth in that consent order. What happened is uh, in 2017, the CFPB went back to look at that consent order and say, did Security National abide by everything in that consent order? And they found out they didn't. So they actually fined them another $1.25 million for failing to comply with previous consent orders. So put that up there just to show, you know, the CPB doesn't just make an order and go away. They do continue to follow up on them. So absolutely something to be aware of. And next, just to give you an idea of CFPB penalties, they really do add up. So here's from 2012 to 2017. Um, I've separated these out by consumer redress that has been ordered, so money going back to consumers, and then fines ordered, and those fines generally go to the CFPB themselves. So lots of money in the millions and billions of dollars that have been collected in penalties. So always good to be aware of everything the CFPB is doing. Um, I want to talk just for a moment about the CFPB's complaint portal. I think it's, it's a really great source of information for any company to look at. If you have not gone in there, and I um, apologize, it's a little hard to see, but even if you just go to consumerfinance.gov, you'll be able to pull up the complaint portal. Um, there's a way in which you can go in and download all of the complaints that are in the portal. So it's really great to be able to go in there, click the download button, it goes into an Excel spreadsheet for you, and then you're able to you know, click on headings, sort, etc. You'll be able to really get an idea of what's going on um, and what types of complaints consumers are after. Um, you can sort by credit union, you can sort by um, debt collection, so it's a really great way to just narrow down and see, um, number one, if you're in there, which you probably already know if you are, uh, or number two, what other um, companies your size have going on. Um, and the, another question I get asked a lot about the CFPB is, what's going on with the collection rulemaking? So collection rulemaking um, started quite some time ago, uh, back in 2013. Um, and it, to get started on it, there, uh, there was a questionnaire that went out, 168 questions um, to the collection industry. They got tens of thousands of responses, and it took them years and years to get through all of those responses. Then in uh, July of 16, a uh, debt collection summary was released. And as a result of that, or at that same time, there was a Sabrifa panel held. So what happens when the CFPB has to, is making rules is they, if the rules are going to impact small businesses, they have to have this Small Business Administration panel. And so they held that in August of 16. And initially, they said that first party collection rules would be posted separately from third party rules. But then, after the Sprefa panel, they're like, you know what, third parties and first parties work so closely together that they wanted to make one rule that covered both first and third parties. So we watched that very closely. Um, then, uh, after further review, the CFPB came out in last year, just August of last year, and said, well, you know, we're going to narrow our focus. Um, on the rulemaking to um, only third party and only communication practices. So that's what we were expecting to come out. Uh, then in November, Mulvaney was appointed as interim director and everything got frozen. So <laughs> that's where we're at on the collection rules. However, that very last bullet point is something I want to bring to everyone's attention, and that was just in January, um, Mr. Mulvaney had a speech and he said they were going to continue, they being the CFPB, is going to continue to look at areas where they, can receive, where they do receive rather the most complaints, such as collections. And he specifically called out collections. So we are taking that as meaning uh, collection rules still are on the horizon. Uh, it's just a matter of time. Uh, we don't know if they're going to include first and third party. Um, 
We assume because first parties do send information to third parties to collect that there may be something in there, especially about the transfer of data between first and third parties. So bringing this up just so that you continue to be aware that there may be some rules on the horizon. So keep watch on the CFPB's website for that. Um, it will also be in the news when it hits. Outside of the CFPB and the TCPA, uh, there are lots of other rules. This is not an exhaustive list, of course, but as you're looking at your uh, policies, procedures, which we're going to talk about in a second here, make sure that you are aware of the FCRA, the Service Members Civil Relief Act, the SCRA, the Military Lending Act on the front end, uh, the Federal Credit Union Act, NCUA's uh, rules and regulations, the Bankruptcy Act, UDAP with its many arms, and EFT. Uh, again, this is just a sampling, but just keep in mind there are a lot of moving parts in regulation uh, that you'll need to be aware of and keep up on. Uh, UDAP I'm going to talk just for a second on simply because it really seems to be one that's a gotcha uh, for many people. <clears throat> the UDAP violation, uh, that I've seen out there or at least what the CFPB and uh, uh, consumer attorneys have said are violations, many times are not something that's written in stone anywhere. Um, what is unfair? What is deceptive? What is abusive? A lot of times is really up to, uh, you know, kind of up in the air. Uh, and it's up to the CFPB or a judge to decide whether an activity taken by somebody in a collection environment has been unfair or deceptive or abusive. So I just, again, I bring that up because it seems to be a gotcha that uh, a lot of customers of ours um, uh, get caught up in. And so make sure when you are looking at uh, your policies, procedures, your compliance management, et cetera, that you have your in-house attorneys really take a close, close look at UDAP to make sure that everything you are doing um, is within UDAP and could not be considered, I should say, a UDAP. All right, moving on. So policies and procedures. <clears throat> I'm hoping that most of you have a, a good policy and procedure manual in place. Um, if not, this is just, an, again, an overview, a guideline for policies and procedures. Um, one thing that um, is clear with the CFPB, with the NCUA, um, with any auditing that may happen um, of, your, of your credit union, Usually the first place that many um, auditors go is to take a look and see what your policies and procedures are. So policies are just a guideline or statement of position with respect to a given topic. It's generally written very high level. Okay? So it's the C-levels, presidents, owners, etc. The, the policy itself is the what, the what of the rule. Okay, and we're going to have a, an example here in just a second. The procedure is the responsibilities of the managers, supervisors, et cetera. It is the how. Okay, it is the how the rule is going to be uh, dictated and uh, put forth in the company. Finally, the work instructions. Here's where you get really, really granular. So it explains step-by-step -step instructions and details on how to do exactly what this policy says. So we'll move on to our example. So for example, the cell phone, you have a cell phone policy. I'm hoping every one of you has a cell phone policy. So overarching cell phone policy, probably very simple, just a couple of sentences. Maybe your cell phone policy says, this policy is to maintain compliance with the TCPA. Our company policy is not to load any cell phone numbers into our AD ATDS regardless of if we have express consent or not. So maybe that is an overarching policy that you have. The procedure would be before loading phone numbers into our ADTS, uh, 
we are going to scrub past this vendor to identify the cell phones, remove the cell phones from our automated dialer. Okay, simple enough. So then you move on to your work instruction. Here's where it gets very, very detailed. This is how you're actually going to do that. So each morning at 6 o'clock, the IT file transfer technician, again, we don't use names. Don't say Bob's going to do this or Sally's going to do this because Bob or Sally might not be here tomorrow. So put that person's title who's in charge of this in there. So you know, they're going to put the phone numbers on the active, pull the phone numbers rather on the active accounts. We're going to send it to our vendor. This is how we send it to our vendor, et cetera. So right on down to you click this button, you do this, you do that. Work instructions should be very, very specific to all of that. So once you've got all of that, your policy, your procedure, your work instruction all gathered together, you should name it, here's our cell phone policy, and put it where everybody has access to it. And the other thing is make sure you're always looking. So, and, and by always, I don't mean daily, but definitely on an annual basis, you should look at all your policies, procedures, and work instructions and make sure they're still valid. You know, if you maybe have a new vendor, substitute the new vendor's name in there. Um, if you have gotten a new system or a new process, make sure that everything is in there. And the idea of this, in the, especially the work instructions, is if Bob or Sally is not here tomorrow, somebody else can pick this work instruction policy procedure up and do the job for them if they're not there. So again, make sure your policies, procedures, work instructions are in place and that they're very detailed and that everybody knows where they are. Uh, some sample policy topics, we talked a lot about cell phones, but here's just a few others. Again, this is just a handful. You, you may have hundreds of policies, procedures, and work instructions based on what you do in your company and, um, and what kind of vendors you have, et cetera. So you may have clean desk policies, internet usage policies, email communication policies, et cetera, et cetera. So you should have each one of these, a policy, a procedure, a work instruction on each one. Uh, make sure everybody in your company that they apply to is aware of them and know how to access them. All right. Um, and just to kind of bring it on home, the CFPB has actually talked about policies and procedures. Um, and they have advised that many companies still don't have proper policies and procedures in place. And they specifically have stated um, the following policies that they would like to see. Again, not an exhaustive list. This is just some that the, they have seen or that they have said they look for. So uh, again, not going to read them all. You guys can look through them. But making sure that you are addressing the accuracy of transferred accounts, addressing adequate maintenance and records, um, policies to ensure adequate oversight of service providers, et cetera, et cetera. That service provider one, actually, they had a, a whole bulletin the CFPB put out on what they expect that you are doing with your service providers. So um, you know, some of their policy requests, get into more detail, but overall these are some of the things that the CFPB says they look for in policies. And then just to uh, finally wrap up policies and procedures, uh, we have seen uh, both good and bad in lawsuits. Uh, so in January last year, uh, the CFPB settled with a law firm and stated that the firm furnish, furnished information to credit bureaus without proper policies and procedures in place to ensure the accuracy. So the CFPB is, again, they went in, they audited this particular law firm, and they said, you don't have adequate policies and procedures in place, and they dinged them for it. On the other side, though, in April of 2017, having policies and procedures in place relating to coding and credit reporting allowed a defendant in a CFPB claim um, to claim a bona fide error defense um, in a FDCPA claim, and they actually won that. So th in this particular case, they, there was an issue, but 
it was a bona fide air defense. They said, you know, we understand we made a mistake, but here's our policy, procedure, and work instruction relating to that. We know what we're supposed to be doing, and here's the remediation action that we took as a result. So that one turned out to be very positive for, um, for convergent outsourcing, which is a, an agency. All right. So I'm going to take a big breath here, move on to compliance management systems. Again, if there's anything relating to policies, procedures you have a question on, feel free to put a question in the Q&A box. Uh, relating to compliance management systems, I have another little poll for you guys. April, would you care to kick off the question? Absolutely. So on your screen you'll see a poll question uh, regarding your internal compliance management system, CMS. Please select one of the three options that you see on your screen here. You'll click next to the option and then submit it and we'll receive your answer. Great. Thank you, April. So again, do you already have what you believe to be a CMS? Um, are you evaluating maybe CMS programs? Or maybe you don't have one in place. Maybe you don't even know what components there are. So um, uh, that would be you don't have one in place. But we're going to talk about uh, compliance management systems here coming up. Uh, letting a next. All right. So I'm going to close the poll now. Thank you, guys. So that's great. Look at that. So the lion's share of people responding do have a CMS in place already. Uh, we have a few people that are evaluating and a few that don't have anything formal in place. So. Hopefully there's something that all three categories can learn a little something of uh, as it relates to compliance management systems. So what is a compliance management system? What is it supposed to do? What is its function within your credit union? So first and foremost, it establishes the compliance responsibilities, who's responsible for doing what relating to compliance. It communicates those responsibilities to your entire organization. It ensures the integration of compliance in production. It reviews and measures legal compliance. It corrects behavior. We're going to talk a little bit about that in more detail as well. And then it updates tools, systems, and materials. So it's a living, breathing thing. It's not something that, okay, here's my compliance management system, I'm done. Absolutely not. A compliance management system is something that's ever-changing within your organization. So um, the components, so what should go into your compliance management system? Again, I want to reiterate, this is something you should be looking at with your legal counsel, with if you have a compliance um, officer or uh, um, something like that. Everyone should work together on what this compliance management system has in it. But at the very top, your board management has, you know, all the board of directors has oversight into the compliance management system. It really has to be done from the top down. It will include your policies and procedures that we've already talked about. It's going to, talk, it's going to contain your training. So as your employees are trained, it tracks that training and um, makes sure that your employees, if they need to periodically be updated on training, it has that in there as well. It monitors um, the corrective action. So if you've had to take a corrective action against an employee, against a vendor, against anything, um, or you've maybe changed or updated a policy and procedure as a result of a lawsuit or a demand letter or something, all that should be loaded in and tracked in your compliance management system. Um, consumer complaints. It should have an intake and response in there uh, as far as tracking as well, um, where you're at in the midst of your entire consumer uh, complaint process. It should have compliance auditing. It should have record keeping and review. Vendor and service provider auditing, and we're going to talk about that in a couple slides here as well. It should have ongoing monitoring of accounts for compliance flags. So for example, are you scrubbing for bankruptcy? Are you scrubbing for Service Member Civil Relief Act, etc.? And then finally, if there are certain licenses that you need to maintain, it should uh, keep track of all of those for you as well. 
So let's talk for a few minutes about vendor uh, or service, priority, service provider, rather, um, some people call third party audits. So both the CFPB and the NCUA have guidance uh, regarding working with vendors and transferring of data to vendors and the vendor's interaction with your credit union's members. And it also talks about auditing your, your vendors. So the CFPB has a bulletin. Um, you can go on the CFPB's website, consumerfinance.gov or cfpb.gov as well, um, and find these bulletins. So the first one was put out in 2012 and then they amended it in 2016. And, and the amendment, it, basically the amendment just said um, that the type of oversight you have on your vendor can change as far as how much oversight you have based on how much that vendor does for you. So they made it scalable, basically, was the change. Um, in April of 2017, the CFPB announced it has begun to examine service providers on a regular systematic basis, uh, particularly those supporting the mortgage industry. Um, NCUA had a supervisory letter back in um, 2007 about third-party audits, and then uh, NCUA has amended rules and regulations about third-party servicing of indirect vehicle loans. So those are the, the different ones we're going to talk about here over the next couple of slides. So first, the CFPB. So here are the, the five bullets that the CFPB says. So as you pull, and I'm sure that many of you have already pulled and read through the CFPB's bulletin on service providers, um, it's a little ambiguous. It doesn't give you step-by-step -step exactly what you should be doing. Um, they, it's a little more of um, uh, ambiguous, so you kind of have to read into what you believe they're saying. But you have to conduct thorough due diligence to verify that your service provider understands and is cap capable of complying with federal consumer financial law. So this is actually a, a big one for your compliance officer or whoever is doing the vendor audits. So this one, you have to know what your vendor is doing for you, and you have to know what federal consumer financial laws that vendor should be abiding by, and then you have to be familiar, familiar enough with those laws to know that your vendor is abiding by them. So that's, that's quite a big task just in the first bullet of the CFPB's requirements. So um, you know, let's take, for example, a, a data provider. Does that data provider have to comply with uh, the FCRA? Do they have to comply with the Bankruptcy Act? Do they have to comply with you know, other things? So you have to know what your service providers has to comply with, and then you have to make sure they are doing that. So that's number one from the CFPB. And then you need to make sure that you're requesting and reviewing your service provider's policies and procedures, um, their internal controls, their training materials. You have to make sure they're training their employees, uh, et cetera. So you also have to um, review your contract, the third bullet. You have to review the contract with your service provider, Make sure it's very clear your expectations of them in that contract. You need to establish internal controls and ongoing monitoring to determine whether that service provider is complying. So make sure that in your compliance management system, you've got something to be constantly tracking those vendors. And then take prompt action to fully address any problems. So this is kind of that remediation bullet that we had earlier. And that is, you know, if, you're, if you find in your audit that the service provider has done something wrong, um, what have you done about that? Um, did you fire them? Did you, um, you know, have them change a policy procedure? Exactly what is it that you did to remediate that action? Uh, the NCUA is a little better. They are a little more detailed. Um, they have main areas in which um, they ask uh, 
planning and risk assessment, due diligence, risk measurement, and then controls. The great thing about the NCUA, though, is that on the links I've provided there, they actually have checklists of what their expectations are. So much more straightforward from the NCUA um, about what they expect in your um, vendor review. I would suggest if you haven't yet to make sure that you go on their website and you download their vendor review um, paperwork and then their checklist because that will help immensely. Um, a lot of people find that you can use that for, um, you know, to cover everything that you need with your vendors. So it's a really great tool to have. All right, I know we're getting down to the wire. We promised you a 45-minute webinar, and um, I see that I've only got about four minutes left. Uh, I do still want to look and see if there's questions, so please, again, submit questions. We will take time for you uh, and answer questions. And if I can't get to them on the phone, I will definitely um, email responses to you. Uh, compliance analytics, this is something that could be part of your compliance management system. You could do it outside of your compliance management system. This is just a really good way to make sure that you, your company, your employees are complying. Um, so make sure that compliance flags are checked. Um, you could do analytics on your call monitoring, voice analytics, etc. Uh, it checks for any FDCPA violations if you, um, you know, need to be aware of them. It checks for FCRA violations. It checks that make sure your credit reporting and updating is being done correctly. And audit reports of your compliance analytics. So compliance analytics is something that you could build in. There are companies out there, uh, software companies, that can do compliance analytics for you but it's just something you should be aware of is available and it's a really great tool. Um, compliance follow-up actions, again, making sure to have your results of your audits tied into your compliance management section, uh, any action or remediation that you've taken, and also a go-forward plan um, for each of your vendors if remediation has been taken. And then, uh, Finally, or next to finally, I should say compliance scrubs, make sure you're doing the easy stuff. Make sure you're scrubbing to get rid of, um, or to be aware of, I should say, bankruptcies, um, any deceased consumers, uh, identify your cell phones, know who owns the cell phones, and doing active military searches. These are things that are readily available through data companies that you can easily get um, and just to make sure that you are on top of those particular things in your data sets. And then finally, make compliance fun. I know it can be a dry and boring topic for everybody, but really you can make it fun for your employees to learn compliance, to keep up on compliance, and to know what's going on. Um, some things I've seen that are kind of fun or different that my customers have done, some of them have pop-up compliance quizzes. So as your um, your employees are on their consumers or on sorry on their computers, a little box will pop up with a little compliance question. They'll never know when it's going to show up, so they're always on their toes, and that's a really fun way to just make sure they're understanding what's going on with compliance. Maybe some interactive training. Um, one of my customers had their C-level personnel do short videos. I thought that was really interesting and a fun way. Um, talked about maybe ethical or precarious compliance situations and how they should be handled. Um, maybe compliance posters around, just as a reminder. Uh, a compliance competition with little prizes. Uh, also, a really good way, you know as well as I do, the best way to learn something is to teach it. So have some of your folks teach their coworkers and that really helps.